THX was a parable about the way we were living in 1970. It wasn't about the future. Everything will be all right. I am here to protect you. We were trying to investigate the ramifications of an unbridled consumer culture that has lost any connection with the organic world and is completely self-contained. Buy more now. Buy and be happy. George was very um, susceptible and is to this day to the notion of empire crushing humanity. THX 1138 didn't have a Luke Skywalker in it. Didn't have that kind of mythic hero, you know. It was actually, I think, a much more complex film. What's wrong? I need something stronger. Take four red capsules. What you see in THX that you see in Star Wars is, is, is the idea of somebody fighting a, against a more powerful kind of, of force. 63410, no, wait for 32. It was sociological analysis it was like putting humanity under a microscope and saying this is who we are this is where we can wind up this is what we stand to lose it was certainly you know to me one of the greatest science fiction movies i'd ever seen The short film of THX, which George had made as a student, was based on a script that Matthew and Robbins and I had written. THX 1138 4 EB. The EB, as I recall, stands for Earthborn. We were actually going to do it as a student film, and George was looking around for a story to do, and he, he, we told him about this project, and he said, aren't, aren't you going to do that underground film? And we said, no, no, we've got something much better. Uh, and um, he said, well, give it to me. I like the idea of a futuristic uh, sort of brave new world. And I wanted to do something extremely visual, you know, that had no dialogue and no character and that sort of thing, and, and sort of cross between a theatrical and a non-theatrical kind of experience. I saw the original version of THX uh, shortly after I met George, and uh, I thought it was really impressive. I loved it. I thought it had just great... Uh, vision, camera work, you know, it was obviously a real piece of film that really worked. It was such a huge vision in, 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 in so very few minutes. It was just, it, it had, it just spoke volumes about the future and, and my favorite subject, science fiction. It's all kinetics, it's all imagery, it's all, you know, it's all working on that level. I was impressed. Then I went to USC at, a, uh, at their annual student awards. And I began to realize, you know, first prize was George Lucas, THX 11384 eb and a uh, special prize, George Lucas, you know, and he was sort of like the whiz kid of USC. Francis said that he would help me get THX made into a feature film. I was sort of always emphasizing to George that cinema, like theater, is really when writing comes together with acting. Francis said, you're never going to become a good director unless you become a good writer. I said, Francis, I can't write a screenplay. He said, well, sure you can. I got paid a little bit of money, finished the screenplay, showed Francis the script, and he said, boy, you're right, you can't write a screenplay. Neither he nor Francis were satisfied with it uh, when he finished it, although it was promising. So I said, look, Francis, Walter and I will sit down and write a draft of the screenplay, because Walter knows what this should be. Since I'd worked on the original, draft and I was in San Francisco and the natural thing was for me to work on the screenplay of THX. So that at that point Walter and I sat down and wrote a script. We started writing the screenplay, this, this last draft, the one that finally got made in June and we started shooting in September so it was a pretty quick uh, move from starting the screenplay to starting production.
Passing THX 1138 was an interesting experience insofar as, first of all, everybody had to have their heads shaved, and, uh, and everybody had to work for scale. Francis was really aware of actors and the need for really great actors and, and how important casting is, how crucial it is. And I think that was a major influence on George. I'd been working with Bobby Duval on The Rain People, and so we became friends, and I was writing my script in the morning when we were working, and so I was telling him, I'm writing the script, I really want you to star in it, and all that kind of stuff. So I would kind of decided on uh, Bobby before I even finished the script. I liked that idea because I hadn't played like the lead in the movie or whatever, and I, there was just a hint, but nothing was uh, really solidified until after the shooting of The Rain People. And then I wanted uh, uh, another comparable actor uh, of Bobby's quality, a really good, strong actor, to play uh, opposite him. Ron Colby suggested Donald Pleasance, and I like Donald Pleasance a lot. Donald was a fascinating character actor in and of himself, and uh, had an interesting career at that time, albeit not on the number one level, so we could afford him. And then I had to find a girl, a female lead, and that was going to be hard. You say to you know some of the hotshot ingenues in town, you know, we're going to pay a scale and shave all the, all the hair off your head. It was like, I don't think so. Yeah, so, you know, I did offer it to, you know, two or three actresses, and uh, they all turned it down. And I spent a lot of time interviewing on that one because she had to shave her head, and she had to look good with her head shaved. It was a, a minimalist role, but it was tough. You know, the, the less you have to do, the harder it is. When I was in San Francisco, I saw... Um, a production of Marat Saad in a, in a small uh, theater. One night the director came and said, oh, these uh, Hollywood people, they're going to be casting a film, and all they want to do is see faces. So, of course, everyone groaned, oh, Hollywood, you know, we're serious actors here. But, of course, they all showed up for the audition. <laughs> and there was this uh, young lady, Maggie McOmey, who caught my eye, and I thought, you know, she has a very haunting quality that I thought would be appropriate for somebody living in this subterranean world. So I guess they liked my face and they called me back. Went back for several times, two, three auditions. And the casting supervisor, Ron Colby, came the next day. I was having lunch at a, at a little luncheonette place eating a carrot salad, <laughs> and he said, quit work, <laughs> work at it, you're in a movie. And casting the movie, you know, we also wanted to get people that basically didn't recognize. They apparently had auditioned everybody they could find in San Francisco for the part, and nobody could come up with the goods. So it was Robert who said to George, why don't you get Don Pedro up here and have him give you a reading? I remember when we were doing the audition, it wasn't like an audition, it was like we were actually in the living set, working at that, living that moment for real on film. And I think maybe that's what uh, allowed everybody to say, yeah, this is gonna work. The caveat where everybody had to shave the hair off their head was, was difficult. I mean, I went to some friends of mine who were half bald, and I said, no, I'm not gonna shave the hair off of my head. When I heard I had to shave my head, I knew I didn't have to f go far anyway. I mean, you know. The experience of getting my head shaved. First of all, we went to this spectacular setting in San Francisco, the Palace of Fine Arts from the 1915 World's Fair that was in San Francisco. It was terrific. I, I really liked it. They liked the way my head looked. There was a concern, but they liked it. She still looked attractive and nice, with even with short hair. And then to get all of the extras to shave the hair off their head, we went to Synanon. Nobody probably remembers what that was, but Synanon was a drug rehab. Paid them $30 a day, and they shaved their heads willingly. They had 30 bucks a day, and they had nothing else to do but walk around in a white suit with their head shaving. It was, they were happy, we were happy, and worked what we needed to do. And then they would, you know, get bussed back over to Synanon and spend the night over there. I wanted it to be like the student film, which is I wanted it to take place in the real world. I contemplated the idea 
which Francis was very enthusiastic about, of doing the film in Japan. Japanese films are interesting to us because they were made by a culture for itself. And the problem that George and I found with science fiction films that we saw is that they felt that they had to explain these strange rituals to you, whereas a Japanese film would just have the ritual and you'd have to figure it out for yourself. So I went off to Japan and saw the locations and everything and, and liked it, but we realized that getting permission to shoot like in nuclear power plants and various kinds of industrial facilities where it's going to be just an unbelievable nightmare. We got the deal finally for everything. We got the budget at that point, which Francis put at $777,000 and 77 cents. Uh, and we realized that I didn't have enough money to go to Japan. So then we started looking for locations here in San Francisco. Fortunately, the BART system wasn't finished yet. And so we started looking at empty bark tunnels, and, and I kind of started rewriting the script around the locations that I had here. The uh, business agent of the local wanted to talk to me, and he said, uh, I promised that you would work on this film. And I said, well, what's it about? And he said, well, it's a bunch of people with bald heads. Then I said, well, who, who's, who's, who's directing it? And he said, uh, uh, George, George Lucas. And I said, uh, I said, who the hell is George Lucas? I think I had seven weeks to shoot it in, which was 35 days. Uh, it seemed like a ton of time to me. Most of the crew had never done a movie before. You know, they were all from San Francisco. It was very rare for a feature to come to the Bay Area. The Bay Area is a beautiful place. It's got great locations. But basically, when a movie comes to San Francisco, they bring a lot of the key people. The cameraman had been documentary cameraman. You know, it was a pretty young group of people, and we were all having a lot of fun. It felt just like working on a very large student film. It resembled um, filmmaking as we wanted to model it. Out of town, very much uh, on his own, and the story not making tremendous dramatic demands. It was really a different kind of vision, uh, more of an experimental vision. It was the most uh, dramatic film I'd ever done in terms of just the plain problems of characters playing with one another and that sort of thing. And even though I was trying to play against that, I still had to deal with the technical side of scenes of two characters playing scenes together. The nude scenes were done at a film studio in Los Angeles. We knew there would be nude scenes in the film. It's a little uncomfortable. I mean, I'm not one for, like, unveiling. I remember Bob was pretty embarrassed when we first shot uh, the first nude scene in the stage, hey, because he didn't know anybody, you know. I put my back to the camera, let her face the camera. That wasn't too chivalrous of me, but uh, it was a little, uh, it was okay once you got going. The chemistry was there for Bob and me. I like the way they came out. I mean, a little hugging and kissing in the movie and all that, and then when you say, cut, I want to hug and kiss a little more. She said, no, you know, you get those feelings going, and it's like, uh, but she drew the line nicely, and, but still was very gracious about everything. The whole prison scene was done in Los Angeles on a white stage. I believe it was 150 feet long and 100 feet wide. It was all white, 360 degrees. It was great because, you know, you could go in any direction. You could have people walking away from you, and then in the next shot, have them coming towards you, and you used cameras still looking in the same direction. You never know <laughs> what's going on. I was watching, and, you know, um, they keep jabbing. Bobby Duvall is rolling around on the floor in agony and so forth. And George is going, on, "Do it again," you know. And, they'd be, and meanwhile, he was he was saying to me, uh, "I got to make a movie that's funnier." I said, "Well, it's pretty grim, I, but I guess this is a grim scene." You know. He said, "I have an idea. I'd like to do a movie that's has is about rock and roll and about cruising, and and as, as, you know, Wolfman, Jack, and so forth." What are you doing here? You're not cleared for this area. You know I have a way with computers. I can program myself for any area, almost. It was my first film. You know, I was learning a lot about uh, things that I never had to cope with. You know, I'd have Bobby Duvall would have his perfect performance on the first rehearsal, and Donald Pleasance didn't even bother to read his lines until about the third take. And if I had a scene with the two of them together, it was really hard. I think, you know, people like George and, and Francis brought in actors that they trusted and they would give them room and see what they could do and what they could bring, 
without pouncing right away and saying, no, do it this way, do it that way. I've been working with people that have done it for two years or 50 years that don't seem to be doing it the right way. He was very relaxed and very laid back, like he'd been doing it for a long time, like a duck to water. He was actually a professional right from the beginning. Amazing for a, a fellow 25 years old. I was quite surprised at how good he was because the only thing I'd heard about him before was from Haskell Wexler and how he had met him in a uh, car racing place and George was a mechanic. George used to tell me that he could walk up to a car and listen for two seconds and tell you what was wrong with the engine. The chase scenes when the robot police on motorcycles were chasing Robert was in the Alameda Tunnel. We had a Lola, this car, and we closed off this tunnel in uh, San Francisco. I remember sitting in the car, getting some points of view and some other things in the car with a, with a stunt driver and going through that tunnel at 140 miles an hour, which is pretty terrifying. I remember when we were shooting one of the motorcycle scenes in the Caldecott Tunnel. Duffy Hamilton was the uh, stuntman that ra rode the motor uh, motorcycle that did the crash. He was a tough guy. Oh, he was a great guy. He was a wonderful kid. And I heard George talking to him saying, now, Duffy, you know, after the crash occurs and you're laying there, don't move because, you know, you'll, you'll ruin the shot. The ramp had been built to this man's specifications and it was, I talked to Kenny Phelps, as a matter of fact, built it. And in fact, I said to Kenny, I said, that looks awful high to me. And he said, that's what he wants. On the set, it looked very dangerous and it looked frightening. He came roaring in and he hit the, the ramp and he almost hit the ceiling. Either the speed of the bike was higher than they thought or the ramp was more angled than they thought or something. And the motorcycle went up through the air and he, the guy fell off and the motorcycle came down and looked like right on top of him. When he went up in the air and landed, and I mean everybody, Francis, myself, everybody ran, we thought he killed himself. Everybody in the room went, <gasps> oh my God, he's dead. And we pulled him out and he didn't move. And he, they pulled his mask off and he's looking right at George and he says, why'd you screw up the shot? I was trying to make the film look like a documentary film. We used to call it the documentary film of the future. And the idea was that it looked very gritty, it looked very real, it looked like it was taking place in a real future. Um, and that's why I used real locations. So we were going in and out of Lawrence Livermore Lab and the Bark Tunnels and the Civic Centers and you know all of these places that they had arranged to get access to. The efficiency with which George was able to make that film and to sort of create his world of that future using nothing other than existing locations, you know, it was pretty phenomenal. We would light it with available lighting, very minimal, just existing lighting in a room. So I definitely wanted that documentary look and feel. And then graphically, in terms of composition, it was extremely stylized. And so I was sort of playing against the fact that it was a documentary, but I wasn't doing the shaky camera, all that kind of stuff. I was doing an extremely stylized look with no camera movement. It's all extremely Japanese in nature, uh, very controlled, but it had this gritty kind of edge to it that was a very documentary feel. When we come out of the white void and open the door to cross the freeway of life, we had such a limited budget, they only had about 10 or 12 actors, and they would go by the camera, everybody more or less holding on each shirt tail so we could keep the ranks tight, and they'd go down and they'd keep circling around. Circle, 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 and move fast as you can, move your feet. So it'd make it look like hundreds of people. It was fun. It was just, it was, the whole thing was new and exciting and lots of fun. Everything was pretty much, you know, gum spit and rubber bands because there was, you know, not enough money. They have a thing that you pick up nuts and bolts with, you know, in a carpenter shop, and that's one of the things that's being used to put the, the hose in Duvall's mouth and into one, I think it was a, a toilet stop or something they were pushing on the side of this thing. Really, I mean, just make all this kind of fun stuff work. We had the old uh, 
Dodge van that came off of rain people. That was our grip, electric, everything. That was like this mobile unit that had, you know, all the cameras on one side and all the sound equipment on another and the dolly on top. And here was like the size of a Dodge van that you could make an entire movie. And we built that together and George painted the cases. I still have some of them here. I can remember I was using it on a shoot going down this freeway. It was shaking. It was so heavy. You know, it was filled to the brim. You could actually go out and make a movie with this thing. The ending sequence where Duval is climbing up to go outside into the atmosphere. We did that at uh, <clears throat> the opening of the Bart Tunnel. That ladder that he was climbing on is actually the rebar that had been embedded in the concrete prior to them putting the rails and the other concrete on top of it. He wasn't climbing at all, he was crawling along the ground. And we looked at this and said, well, I don't know, this, this is hokey looking. But uh, George knew what he was doing and it looked perfect. When George was finishing THX, he needed the last shot, which is Robert Duval escaping from the underground city. That kind of second unit work is tedious because you have to sit out there sometimes for two or three days for it to get the sun right. So Caleb Deschanel and Matt Robbins volunteered to go out and sit on the beach and get that shot. We found this place in Port Wanimi where the sun would set right at the end of the beach. We had a thousand millimeter lens which on, you know, in that format is really a long lens and uh, we didn't have Bob Duval, we had Matthew Robbins played that character in that. I put on uh, Bob Duval's costume and I put on, because I had very long <laughs> wild hair in those days, I put on a skull cap, a flesh colored, um, a bald cap. And we went out there three or four times and every time the, we got towards sunset the fog would roll in and we would miss the shot. At the time none of us had any money but Matthew's uh, wife Janet actually had a job and actually had a credit card and I remember going out and eating in a restaurant on her credit card which is really exciting for us at the time. Eventually the sun came into frame and I stood up as if climbing out of a underground world in a silhouette. The sun sets you know in the shot it's at 24 frames and everybody thinks it's time-lapse because it you just see the shape of the sun and that long lens and the atmosphere of the the sun setting it's just you know, it just changes shape and, and it's exciting and all the credits roll over that shot. And cut! Great. Yeah. That's a wrap. Right on. That's a wrap, everybody. Thank you. I was mostly editing in Mill Valley. I worked in the attic of my house. Which was just an ordinary little suburban house. We had one chem. I would cut stuff during the day, and then Walter would cut stuff at night in terms of the sound, and we would sort of play off each other, and then we'd sort of talk about what one person was doing, so we were doing the whole film together. That sort of mutual influence is something that we uh, uh, experienced at film school, grew out of the film school experience. Never, 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 never mind. Can you feel this? THX is an alien world. Maybe it's on this planet, maybe it's not, we don't know. So I had to not only do the sound, but I had to create a world. Walter and I approached it, this is an environment, what do we think this should sound like? And Walter would play with lots of different ideas. It's an open invitation for a mind like Walter Murch to come in and create a, a symphonic treatment of soundtrack. You know, he'd play stuff for me and say, oh, I think we should do this. And, and, you know, these really interesting, bizarre combinations of picture and sound and would really then spur me editorially to go on and cut it a different way. George's whole idea of the used future, which you see very much in Star Wars, is present already uh, in THX. And that was another distinction between science fiction films, even like 2001, which we, we both admired very much, but everything was brand new. And yet in reality, when you look around the world, most of the stuff you see is used. So if it's set in the future, everything wouldn't be new. It would be new to us, but it would look used. And we wanted to have the sound be like that.
A lot of the sound in THX is designed counter to what's actually going on in the scenes. We took the sound effects and made them to be like music. And then in some cases, we take the music and make it to be like sound effects. My vision was not to do a normal story. You know, I wanted to do something that was abstract. So we were trying deliberately to be mysterious, which I think is one of the things that drove Warner Brothers mad. <laughs> Walter and I would sit you know, for hours trying to figure out how abstract I was going to be. It was a film from the future rather than about the future. But the film made no attempt to explain any of this or to draw judgments about it or to say that it was bad or good. It just said, this is an artifact which instead of washing up on our shore from a distant land has washed up from the future and make of it what you will. It's about being trapped in a cage with the door unlocked, but being unwilling or afraid to open the door and go out. We have to go back. This is your last chance to return. There's also the theme of American Graffiti, which is being trapped in a small town, wanting to leave, but being afraid to leave. The idea of Luke escaping from Tatooine, going out into the world, I think that's a theme that you can see in a lot of George's films, and in fact in George's life. The idea that George Lucas, son of the office supply man in Modesto, became the creator of the Star Wars series is a strange, wonderful journey. And if you look at THX and various aspects of that with that in mind, you'll see this theme bubbling to the surface. I haven't changed much over the years. It's funny, if you were to see all the films, you begin to see that there's a certain continuity of eccentric taste that flies through those movies. Twelve years old, I went to see this movie. Not THX. Actually, I went to see The Brotherhood of Satan, which is this low-budget horror movie. Playing as the second feature to this was, was THX 1138. In fact, I was so knocked out by THX, I ha hadn't expected it, that I stayed and sat through The Brotherhood of Satan again so that I had to watch THX again. It was the first time where I really completely grasped that there was a filmmaker at work. There was a storyteller at work. I didn't even know who this guy was, but I got a mental image of him. I got this image in my head of this guy whose perspective and worldview and sociological view, it was stamped on every frame of that film. For me, it was, wow, here's another reason and a greater reason for film to exist. It's a form of communication where you can really convey ideas and really say something. And when I walked out of the theater, I remember thinking, I have to do this. What George was practicing wasn't just putting his ideas on the screen. Every shot was about craft. The lighting, the makeup, the, the, you know, the, 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 the costumes. It was just a combination of all the crafts. THX 1138 was an extraordinary film for its time. I mean, it anticipated uh, a universe of films. I think, in a way, the THX was inspirational in some way to Blade Runner. I mean, I see certain similarities, a kind of emotional distance, you know, sort of vast, wide shots showing a kind of apocalyptic and very George Orwellian kind of a world where you're always being spied on and, and, and observed from above or through walls. and. I, I think that, you know, THX had a profound impact on a lot of science fiction filmmakers that made pictures subsequent to that. I enjoy that movie and what I was trying to do with it as much as anything I've ever done. We loved it, you know. It was definitely uh, the kind of film that we wanted to make and uh, was looking at some interesting questions uh, in the guise of a science fiction film. In the end, I make the movies for myself, and for whatever reason, I've managed to make movies that I like, and I still like them. And some of them work better than others. Some of them I made a lot of mistakes on, but I still love the movies, and I don't regret ever having made a movie, and I'm very thankful for that.